Okay. So, did anyone watch the NVIDIA keynote yesterday? So you guys did? So, yeah, so that's kind of the Apple event for hardware engineers now and machine learning engineers as well. So there's now this H100 architecture. So Hopper is the um, kind of the generation after Ampere. Um, and I mean, these, these graphs are really impressive. Um, so, I mean, we motivated some of this hardware work by GPT-3. And the first plot shows that, you know, you can get almost a 7x improvement on GPT-3, um, giving kind of an H100 cluster instead of um, an A100 cluster. Um, the second plot shows that, you know, yeah, it shows that, you know, training can be up to nine times faster and latency, um, yeah, up to 30 times. 30 times throughput while maintaining the same latency. So, I mean, the numbers are very impressive. So, so I mean, how did we get there? Uh, and this is just a preview slash spoiler of the, um, of, the of the talk, but I recommend actually watching it because it's quite technical. It goes into kind of what's relevant, uh, the relevant models in machine learning today and how to optimize them uh, and, how NVIDIA, and what NVIDIA's approach was. Uh, we'll see that they focused a lot on kind of, you know, raw throughput. And it's interesting because we see a shift in the numeric formats. So if we compare uh, Ampere, A100, to the H100, we're now, um, in the Hopper architecture, they're focusing much more on floating point formats. Um, so FP8, uh, I don't know how many bits they assign to the mantissa and the exponent, but it's very different from int8. And typically it has a bigger dynamic range based on how many bits are assigned to the exponent, but much smaller mantissa. So um, it's also, you can think of it as a nonlinear kind of quantization because you have um, an exponent uh, and a mantissa. So the numbers usually on the number line that can be represented by FP8 are no longer kind of equally spaced. Uh, they're usually kind of, there's an exponent and there are a few numbers around it. And then another exponent you can represent and a few numbers around it. Uh, so, so, I mean, it's quite interesting. Uh, what, what we saw back at Intel, like, I don't know, that's five, six years ago now. We were using FP8, FP9, and FP11. Um, so, so to me personally, it's interesting to see people shifting to that numerical format now and embedding it in the GPUs. It also seems that they got rid of int 8 altogether. So they have FP8 and FP16, and then uh, other floating point formats as well. So it's quite interesting. A big, a big focus of the talk as well was how to scale these GPUs to how to connect many of them in kind of a rack, then a cluster, then kind of a supercomputer scale. Uh, they really focused on NVLink and how kind of, uh, and that's re very relevant to the lecture today actually, because we will see that when you're training a model using multiple GPUs, you do need a lot of communication bandwidth in some cases or in all cases, frankly. Um, so yeah, so I mean, as kind of an extra thing, if, uh, if you're interested in, in watching this keynote, I'd highly recommend it. As I said, it's quite technical. Um, so yeah, uh, so lots of interesting things. Um, one thing is, you know, what's the catch? Like, how do you get 7x performance, right? Um, can anyone guess? Uh, so, so there's a catch, and there is, uh, there's a good thing, and there's a catch. So any? Yeah, so, so basically, this chip is now 700 watts. Um, and by comparison, let's see, the previous one was 400 watts. So approximately 2x of those 7x or 9x are coming from just, you know, <laughs> putting more power into this chip. Um, and I think uh, Ampere was 7 nanometers. Is it written there? No. It was seven nanometer technology. That means the transistor size is seven nanometers, the channel gate, um, whereas this one is four nanometers. And so, you know, we halved the size of each transistor, um, but because of, you know, Denard scaling, which you guys learned about, we're not halving the power density. And so I think they are maxing out kind of the power envelope now of a board that they can stick in a data center and have, you know, a proper cooling for it. Um, this, this can be both water cooled and air cooled. Um, so yeah, so that's, I think that's the catch basically. Uh, other stuff obviously includes, you know, they have now dedicated support for 
you know, uh, transformers. They have this new numerical format, which could all use less power. Um, but they also needed to double the power to get these performance numbers. OK, so on to today's lecture. And this is quite an interesting topic, uh, uh, distributed training. So I think there are, um, I mean, many of the techniques that we'll see are quite simple and straightforward. But again, it gets you to think outside of that you know, single device box. I'm not optimizing one device anymore. I have to think about the whole system. And so we'll be talking a lot about communication between devices. So just a reminder, we're kind of in our last module called ML Systems. Uh, we covered kind of pre and post processing and what that means, uh, you know, for the performance of over the, over the overall performance of my system. And we talked about Amdel's law there and Amdel's law is the main thing I think in pre and post processing. And we'll talk about distributed training to see how can we actually scale, you know, training to many GPUs uh, and they'll use the word GPU here, but it's just many devices um, and train these very large models. Um, so, so I mean, what what's wrong with training on a single GPU, right? So there is there are a couple of obvious problems. The first one is that you know you're limited by the speed of that single GPU, and as I said again, I'm using the word GPU throughout this lecture, but you know you can replace it by TPU or FPGA or whatever. So you're limited by kind of the performance of that single GPU. So it depends on how many multiply, accumulate operations I can do per second for a specific workload, right? Um, but then uh, a hard constraint is actually, um, you know, your memory. So whatever memory is attached to this chip is limiting you in terms of the size of the model that you can put on that GPU and actually run it. And so what do you have to fit in that memory? You have to fit, you know, the model parameters. And so if the model parameters don't fit, that's it, you can't do it. Um, but during training, you also have to fit, you know, the mini batch of data. You have to fit the forward activations, the backward gradients, and some optimizer states. And so all of these things have to fit uh, based on the mini, the, the mini batch size that you are training for. And so if that doesn't happen, you need to go to multiple GPUs. Um, or you can't train that model without multiple GPUs. And if your training is too slow, like it will take years, uh, for example, Again, you have to go to multiple GPUs to make that work. So these are two kind of very obvious and clear um, reasons to go to multiple GPUs. And you know, the main motivation, uh, I took that slide from uh, our lecture too, is that you know, deep neural networks are getting much bigger. And so you know, if we wanted to train AlexNet, um, they actually had to use two GPUs at the time to, to train this effectively. And they split it in an interesting way, which we'll talk about. Um, but now, you know, the models are much larger. Um, you know, where is the, yeah, 175. So we're in the hundreds of billions of parameters now, uh, as opposed to uh, millions of parameters. So we haven't hit trillion parameters yet. I think Microsoft was working on something that's, uh, that's that big, but we're in the hundreds of billions uh, of parameters. And you know, when you look at GPT-3, uh, why is it so well known and why is it so effective and successful? It's because you know, it's a general uh, language model uh, that kind of uses, uh, uh, like who knows how GPT-3 works actually? Like by just a show of hands, kind of. Okay, so basically what, what happens is that they took all the text of the internet and they trained next word prediction on, on this GPT-3 model. And it's a huge model, right? Uh, but then if they want to do any language modeling tasks, like next word prediction, that's one task, um, you know, um, code synthesis, for example, writing code for you, that's another task, uh, question answering, giving it a question and taking an answer, that's another task. You can always train these downstream tasks very easily given this huge uh, embedding model called GPT-3. So if you think of it, um, you know, text is actually the simplest uh, modality in this case. What if I want to train a general model like this for images? So instead of you know, my tokens being a single word, now they become you know, an image, which is you know, megapixels instead of a few bytes. What if I want to do this for video or speech? So basically, um, you know, for the different modalities already, you can see that if you want to train a GPT-3-like model, you have to do way more than you're doing now in terms of hardware. So these machine learning researchers are kind of waiting for 
this next generation of hardware to come that gives you this leap in performance, uh, at least an order or two orders of magnitude, to at least correspond to the order of magnitude difference in the size of the data between text and image and you know speech and other things. And people are already talking about you know multimodal uh, models. So there is, um, if you search for Google Pathways, so Jeff Dean at Google is very interested in this multimodal model called Pathways. Um, again, which not doesn't just take texts and speech and images, but like all modalities at the same time. And so how to even approach the idea of training these very huge models. Yes, you have to go to multiple devices, but you also have to, you know, um, figure out scaling, um, you know, both at the device level and multiple devices and get kind of orders of magnitude improvement. Um, so I think distributed training is kind of now one of those things which we have to do. Uh, it's not optional anymore. Um, and yeah, let's see how we can do it. So we'll talk about three things here. Um, so d there are two ways of doing distributed training on multiple devices. Uh, first one is called model parallelism. So that's where you know the model doesn't fit inside the GPU memory. So I take the model and I split it into parts uh, and put it on different GPUs. Um, the second thing that we'll talk about is data parallelism. So basically the model can fit uh, on my GPU, but um, my mini batch doesn't fit. And I want to train it faster, so I split the mini batch into two and you know, put it on two devices or more. And then finally, we'll talk about quickly some compression techniques for kind of uh, making GPU to GPU communication faster. So model parallelism, so what is that? So I'm showing a model here on the left. I think that's efficient net. Um, and you know, model parallelism is very simply you know, taking that model, taking a piece of it, uh, putting it on a, one GPU, taking another piece of it, and putting it on another GPU. Um, and what does that mean? That means you know, the parameters associated with this first piece are now stored in this GPU's memory, and the parameters associated with the second piece are stored in this GPU's memory. And then when I compute you know, the forward pass, the first part is computed on GPU zero, the second part is computed on GPU one. So you can already kind of see that, you know, we have to do stuff other than normal training. So first, you know, I need to move the input data or my mini batch onto GPU zero, right? And then I'll compute the forward pass on GPU zero for that first part of the model. Then after that, I need to move the activation. So the output of this first part of the model, which is usually a very large tensor, I need to move it between GPU zero and GPU one, right? And then I can use these activations as input for my second part on GPU one. And then I will run the forward pass on, on GPU one. I'll move the labels to GPU one because that's what I'll use to compute the loss. Then I'll compute the loss and then start back propagation on GPU one. Um, and then I move the gradients. Uh, so now I'm doing the backward pass. I'm moving the gradients from GPU one back to GPU zero uh, to compute the rest of the gradients. So I'll run part one backward pass on GPU zero. And then finally, I can now update the parameters because I have both the forward and the backward pass computed on all models. So th did that make sense? Basically, you know, I have the model split here. I go forward pass, then copy to GPU one, then forward pass and compute loss, backward pass, copy to GPU zero, backward pass. So, you know, every time I say move something from one GPU to the other, something is happening. It, it doesn't happen automatically. They don't share the same memory space. Uh, they're usually in on different, you know, chips on my motherboard or whatever it is. Um, and so I have to copy these things somehow. And the standard way to do this and the standard way GPUs are connected together is through a CPU. And so I need to do these PCIe transfers, you know, from GPU zero to GPU one. Um, and you know, how do I do it in terms of code, at least on PyTorch, simply, you know, whatever tensor, dot two, and then device name. So uh, at least it's very simple programmatically. But this of course, you know, incurs some overhead. So this takes time. And the other thing with model parallelism is that, you know, there is also these dependencies. I need to wait for, you know, GPU zero to finish its forward pass before I start, you know, operation on GPU one. And so, uh, so model parallelism is, uh, is actually quite hard to get to work with at full throughput of a GPU system.
Okay, so I'm showing here kind of the code for a toy model. Let's say that it kind of represents this network here, and I'm splitting it into net one and net two. It doesn't actually matter what's in net one and net two, um, but if you if you take a moment and look at that code, how, how can I change it to work on multiple GPUs? So as I said in the previous slide, you know, to move stuff, I just need to write this command, right? And so how can I change this model by adding, you know, dot two CUDA one or CUDA zero to make it run on two GPUs? And specifically what I want to do is I want to, you know, run net one on GPU zero and net two on GPU two, uh, GPU one. So, so if you take kind of a minute and, um, and write the different dot two move commands, um, to make that work kind of uh, with model parallelism. If you look at that code now, so basically I just need to add those two, you know, CUDA zero, CUDA one. So I'm just placing the parameters first on the right GPU. And then here I'm moving the input to the first GPU because that's where I'm going to you know, run that first part of the model. And then I take my intermediate activations. I move them from GPU zero to GPU one. And then I can, you know, run the second part of the network. Right? So, um, so yeah, this is the simplest way of doing it. There are libraries that kind of uh, try to encapsulate that a bit more and and do it I mean, in a bit more implicit way. Um, but that's kind of the easiest way to do it, really, is to write a wrapper on top of your model, split it however you like, and move things between GPUs. Um, one other thing you're trying to do here is balance the runtime between your two devices. And so that's another kind of issue with model parallelism typically is that you know, your different devices on which you split the models, um, they should ideally run at approximately the same speed so that you can try to pipeline it well. And um, yeah, so I mean, to get around you know, the memory issues, sure, you can put some a bit of your model on the CPU, but that means that you, know, you have all of these overheads of swapping in and out the model and so on. Um, and you know, speaking of that, actually pipelining this is not easy. Um, because, let's see, is there a thingy here? No, but basically there are many data dependencies. And so, you know, you have to do forward zero and then uh, forward one. No, that's not good. And then forward one and then backward zero and then backward one. Um, so, so there are data dependencies here, but that means that, you know, what can I run here? Um, and people have figured out ways, uh, does that make sense? So that's kind of the, the timeline of GPU zero, what's it's executing, if that's the timeline of GPU one. And so um, ideally I'll try to fill those empty kind of idle periods with something. Um, and people have figured out ways to do that, um, but you do have this hard memory dependency between uh, sections of your computation. So basically, uh, people do it by splitting the mini batch in some way, using stale parameters and, and doing things like that. But, um, but yeah, it's not, it's not easy uh, to pipeline these systems. So. so some people split the models in different ways. So this is from kind of the original AlexNet paper um, where each layer was split into two parts. Um, and what that means, so basically um, they used groups for that. So they had, two, uh, they had a grouped convolution with group size equals two and they ran each group on a different GPU. But that meant that after each layer, we had some synchronization to do. So we had to send the output of this you know, bottom part, which runs on GPU one, for example, to the input of this top part and so on. So, um, so that's kind of a different way of, uh, of splitting the computation. The previous one I showed is just very coarse grained, splitting the model in half, but here we're splitting every layer uh, in half, basically. And we do the same for fully connected layers where, you know, we split them in half, but after each layer, we do need to synchronize the gradients and the forward uh, pass as well. So, um, yeah, so, so model parallelism. So basically people usually do model parallelism uh, when it's necessary, right? So when 
you can't get away with running um, on a single GPU because of hard memory constraints, right? But however, you have, you have this issue of, you know, it's very hard to pipeline it usually. Uh, you need to be very careful about load balancing. So you need to make sure that each part kind of runs approximately for approximately the same time on the different GPUs. Um, and so there is some manual work that you have to do uh, to be able to hide the synchronization latency. Um, yeah, any, uh, any kind of other um, thoughts about model parallelism? Usually model parallelism is more limited in performance than data parallelism, which we'll look at next, um, just because of these kind of synchronization overheads and um, these hard constraints related to synchronization. Um, for the AlexNet one, it was done because of performance. I don't think it was strictly because of memory, but I may need to double check that. Um, but basically, um, yeah, you can, you can split the model however you want, basically. Okay, let's see. Okay, so that's model parallelism at a very high level. Like, okay, you need to split the model. You can split it in different ways and put it on multiple GPUs. You just have to be careful about kind of, you know, filling those GPU cycles and minimizing the idle time. And then programmatically, it's very easy to do by just using those, you know, dot two CUDA one, dot two CUDA zero commands. So data parallelism is actually, um, you know, um, quite important. And usually when a model is large enough that you need to split it across multiple devices, sometimes you also put data parallelism on top of that. So they're composable techniques as well. And so if I'm training on a single GPU, that's usually what I'm doing. I have you know, my data, I have my model, they're all in the same GPU, and then I'm doing the forward pass, backward pass, wait update, right? If I have multiple GPUs, um, so what am I doing now? The first thing is that you know, I want to split the data across the GPUs. And so that's why it's called data parallelism. So I take my mini batch, and in this case, I put a quarter of it on each of the different GPUs. Um, but then what I need to do next is, you know, I can't just independently compute the forward pass, backward pass, and wait update for all, uh, for each GPU separately. Uh, this is the same mini batch, and the way mini batches work is that you're averaging the loss from the different, um, from the different inputs, right, from the different samples or pieces of your training data. And so what I need to do is I need to aggregate the gradients somehow and average them before I do the wait update to capture the information from all of the mini batch, from all of the, you know, mini batch pieces. And so what we do is that we add this extra computation called averaging the gradients. But what's happening here again implicitly is that there is a lot of communication between GPUs. And so what I need to do is that for the gradients on GPU zero, I need to broadcast them to all other GPUs and then I would add them all up here on each GPU, and then I would take the average, and then I would compute, uh, you know, the weight update based on that. Uh, so the problem is that I need to do this for each GPU. So for every GPU, I need to kind of broadcast my gradients to all of the other GPUs. We need to average the gradients there, and then we can update the weights. Basically, what is the communication requirement here per GPU? Uh, first of all, is it is it kind of 100% clear why we need to broadcast the gradients? Does that make sense? Yeah, so we need to average the gradients over the mini patch before we do the weight updates. Um, but yeah, so what's, uh, what's the communication requirement? So by the way, this technique is called all reduce. And you will see these terms, which has, you know, two words stuck together. They're all MPI terminology, message passing interface. And that's kind of for inter-process communication. It's a library for inter-process communication that everyone on earth uses, they use multiple devices. And so you'll see, you know, this is called all reduce and it's coming from MPI. Um, but uh, what is the communication requirement? How many, uh, how much, uh, what is the communication cost? If, you know, I have K gradients, so my gradients are size K and I have N GPUs. So how many gradients will each GPU have to broadcast every cycle? Yeah, so for example, GPU zero has to broadcast its K gradients to three other GPUs. So if I have N GPUs, um, 
what is kind of the general formula here? Take a guess, just shout anything. <laughs> uh, uh, K times N minus one. N times K minus one. N times N minus one. Is that per GPU or is that total? Oh no, we're talking about per GPU. So it would be, okay. So yeah, exactly. So basically each GPU has to transfer K gradients to N minus one other GPUs, right? And so, so what's the problem with that, right? Like, uh, okay, so I can just do that, that's fine. I'll scale my number of GPUs. What happens as N increases? So the communication cost also increases linearly. So I'm trying to, you know, scale my computation so that I have multiple GPUs and I do things faster, but I actually have this overhead called communication between GPUs that's also scaling linearly and it's getting worse the more GPUs I add. So quickly at some point you find that your runtime is dominated by this communication and it doesn't make sense to add more GPUs. So it's a very bad parallelization paradigm because you know, um, the more you parallelize, the slower you get at some point when the communication overhead is um, kind of the dominant, um, the dominant runtime factor. So, so obviously people don't use all reduce, although at the beginning people started using all reduce, but people don't use it anymore uh, because of that reason. Um, and we need to figure out, you know, other ways of doing it. So Harish also already kind of mentioned one way of doing it kind of let's send all the parameters to a single GPU and let's do the gradient averaging there and then broadcast back. Um, so that makes sense. Can you think of other ways of doing this as well? So if you're, if you're a system architect, you're at Google, you want to train on their kind of uh, big data center clusters and you don't want your communication cost to scale linearly with the number of devices. What else can we try here? So. I mean, let's work off of uh, Harish's suggestion, for example. What if we have, you know, one, let's call it server, a parameter server, where we average all the parameters there, and then we broadcast it back to um, kind of the workers or the GPUs that are computing, you know, my model. What, what becomes the bottleneck in this case? Yeah, go ahead. Okay, so the performance of your parameter server essentially becomes, you know, the bottleneck. Uh, okay, so, so you want to leverage kind of the speed of local communication within one server, as opposed to going to a data center network and transferring thing, things that way. Yeah. Okay. I see. So, so basically, this is one way that people do things. So there are, I've seen papers doing hierarchical kind of data parallelism. So you would kind of reduce the gradients within a pod, uh, and then you would broadcast those averaged gradients out. Uh, you can also combine it with model parallelism, which I think is what you're kind of getting at. Um, but, uh, but yeah, that's a great point. So doing it hierarchically based on the data center architecture, that's, that's also a great way. We'll actually not cover that in the slides, but there are papers. Yeah. So basically, I mean, these are all great answers, um, and 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 that's what we do. So so now you know we have our four GPUs here. Instead of having this all-to-all -all communication uh, after each forward pass, or each backward pass rather, then we will have this thing called a parameter server. So once we finish, uh, and and we just for terminology, we'll call these GPUs workers, and we'll call that GPU server or parameter server. And these GPUs would compute the forward pass for different parts of the mini batch. They would compute the backward pass, and then they would send all the gradients to the GPU, which is designated as the server. We would do some averaging there, and then we would broadcast the result back to all GPUs. So is this better in terms of communication cost uh, compared to the all reduce? And you know, um, the, the problem with all reduce is that communication costs scale linearly with the number of devices. So the more devices I add, the more communication I have. What happens here? So if I have K gradients and I have N workers, 
how much does each worker send slash receive, or let's just say send. Okay, um, so that's correct, I think. Yeah, so it's K per server, per worker. But what happens at the server side? So at the server side, I still have that problem because now I've added all of that communication cost at my server. So my server has to receive KN gradients per forward pass or per, um, per mini batch. And so I still have that linear scaling problem. So the more workers I add, the more communication I have at the server side. And so that will quickly become the bottleneck and I can't scale it any further. So how do I fix that? <laughs> Sorry? Use multiple servers. Yeah, so it, it is as simple as that. So people use multiple servers for that. Uh, and so now what is my communication cost? So, so, so that's a good point. Um, but um, you can do that um, reduction locally on each GPU. So you can compute, so, so that's what happens in kind of parallel parameter servers. You're computing, you know, half the result on each server, and then you, you send two sets of gradients to each worker GPU, and then the reduction happens there. So, um, but some people, as I said, do it hierarchically as well, where kind of this level of servers, they would broadcast it to another one, which does that reduction, and then that one broadcasts it back. So that happens as well. Um, so the communication cost now for K gradients and workers and S servers. So the problem last time was, you know, my servers um, had to send KN gradients or had to receive KN gradients per mini batch. So what happens now when I have, you know, S servers? Um, so basically I'm dividing by S, right? I think there is a factor of two in there somewhere, but I, yeah. At a high level, we're just dividing by S. So each server is now uh, responsible for one over S of all of the gradients. And so this scales quite nicely. Um, typically, I think Google uh, uses this a lot, uh, at least historically. They came up with it uh, and they uh, used it for all of their large models. And the idea is, you know, you have these parameter servers um, and whenever you run into a communication bottleneck, you add one more server and you use that for reduction and so on. Um, but the problem here is that, you know, you still have a linear scaling. It's not with N anymore, which is good because you can scale the number of workers. But then whenever you scale N, you also need to scale S to keep that ratio uh, at a good level. And so the problem now is that, you know, I kind of have this overhead of adding these parameter servers to begin with. Uh, so I have these servers that are just waiting for the gradients to average them and send them back. And so this is not you know, the ideal way. The ideal way is that I wouldn't have overhead here and I would have scaling that's independent of the number of GPUs, right? So can I achieve that? Do you think there's a way to do that? Um, the hint is yes, there is a way. So, so let's see what, what we can do there. So, I mean, the, one, one nice thing about deep learning is that we are re kind of uh, not reinventing, but rediscovering many methods that existed already before. So this is an example of something that was used in HPC applications for a long time. Usually it was multiple CPUs, not GPUs, and things like weather simulations and stuff. Uh, but still, we uh, this thing called ring all reduce. So that existed um, and predates you know deep learning by a long time. And the idea is that what we want to achieve is this all reduce operation, right? So we have gradients on four GPUs. The gradients are A, B, C, and D. And we want to end up with you know, the sum of all gradients or the average, same thing, um, on, on, all, on all of the GPUs. So how do we do that? We can break down this all reduce operation into something called reduce scatter and all gather. Again, this is MPI terminology, um, if, it, if it sounds weird. Uh, but basically, what is reduce scatter? I'm, breaking each tensor or each vector, each array on each GPU into N chunks where N is the number of GPUs, right? And then now each of my GPUs, each of my worker GPUs is responsible for computing a partial sum for part of that array. That is reduced scattering, right? So I'm breaking the arrays into pieces 
And then I'm saying each GPU is responsible for a piece of that array. And then now I end up with these GPUs having, you know, the a piece of the result essentially. So this is kind of the result on the first GPU, the result on the second GPU, and I need to broadcast it to all GPUs. So we do an operation called all gather, which is basically this broadcast, sending this, you know, uh, piece of the array to the different GPUs. And you end up with, you know, the whole results on each GPU. Does that make sense? So basically we're decomposing this addition operation or averaging, it's the same thing, into different parts. Each part is the, you know, each array is broken down into N parts where N is the number of GPUs. Each array, uh, each GPU is now responsible for aggregating um, the different parts for that piece of the array. And then we broadcast that. So, you know, reduce scatter is the part where we compute the sum. And then all gather is just we broadcast that partial sum to all of the GPUs. And if this is confusing, we'll go through it kind of step by step. Um, but the reason it's called all reduce is that communication, we can implement this in a way where communication is only, you know, from one GPU to one GPU. So you only need a ring topology uh, in your network to actually compute this. So to compute this, you know, reduce scatter and all gather, you actually only need to ever receive and send data from one GPU next to you. And, you know, in networks, the ring topology is the most scalable topology because to add a new node, you can easily add it and connect it to just two, two existing nodes, right? If I want to add another GPU here. And so you already see where this is going. This would be a much more scalable way of doing this. Um, so let's see how, how it works. So here we have five GPUs, not four anymore, just to make it slightly more confusing. Um, and first we want to do this reduce scatter operation. So I broke down the array into each array into five pieces because five is the number of GPUs that I have. And then now I will proceed and, and have this logical kind of view in your head where these are connected in a ring. So GPU zero can only ever send to GPU one and receive from GPU four, right? The GPU two can only ever receive from GPU one and uh, send to GPU three. So, so that's what I'll do. I'll send, you know, this first part from GPU zero to GPU one. And as I'm sending it, I'm adding the partial result. So now I send that piece, I'm adding a one plus a zero here, B two plus B one. And I keep summing, you know, in that ring topology. So. Again, as you can see communication, I'm sending, you know, one piece of that array, which is equal to the size of my gradients divided by the number of GPUs. And as I'm sending it between GPUs, I'm summing it up. I'm adding it to that section that exists on that GPU. So we keep doing that until we have the result sitting uh, or, or a piece of the result sitting on each GPU. So now each GPU has one finalized chunk. So uh, these golden kind of bordered uh, pieces are, you know, GPU zero now has, you know, all of the Bs summed together. GPU one has all of the Cs, uh, GPU two has all of the Ds, and GPU three has all of the Es, and finally GPU four has all of the As. So now the result exists, it's just on different GPUs. So now I'm done with this piece called reduce scatter. Uh, does that make sense so far? Nods, yes. So I just split my gradients based on the number of GPUs I have. So I have five GPUs, I do five splits. So, yeah. So vertically, these are my different mini batches. Remember, I'm, I'm training uh, not different mini batches, but different pieces of the mini batch. I'm training different pieces of the mini batch on each GPU, and I want to average all of the gradients between them. So each one has a set of gradients related to the inputs that it was trained with, and I want to add them all up. I actually want to average them, but it's the same operation, right? Um, and so I'm splitting each set of gradients into five pieces, and, I, and the goal is to add all of these arrays together, right? Any more questions? Okay. Okay, so, so now I've done this operation called reduce scatter. Um, a piece of the result. And what I want to do next is this all gather operation 
where I send those pieces of results to all of the other GPUs. So let's do that. So now we're doing all gather. So again, this is connected in a ring topology. Every GPU can only send to uh, the CPU, uh, the GPU next to it and receive from the GPU before it. And so it's the same idea. So we will just uh, broadcast and this time we will not be adding anything on the GPU. So we will send you know, this and replicate it. For example, we'll replicate this block on GPU zero. So now we have two pieces of the result on GPU zero. We'll replicate this block now on GPU zero and this one on GPU one and so on until we have kind of the full result on all GPUs. So now all GPUs have finalized partial sums. Um, so they, um, they're simply added together to compute the average, uh, the average gradient. So now um, that's, uh, that statement is actually not 100% correct. Uh, but basically now we have you know, the same thing on all GPUs and it's the sum of all gradients on all GPUs, right? So we've done what we wanted um, and now let's look at the communication costs. So, you know, for NGPUs, K gradients, and in the middle case, you know, S parameter servers, that's what we needed before. Uh, we needed K times N minus one for all reduce, and we needed K times N over S for parameter servers, given that overhead of, you know, having these parameter servers to begin with. So now who can tell me what the communication cost is for ring all reduce? So now all of the GPUs are the same. Uh, they're sending and receiving the same kind of bandwidth. And there are two operations, right? So there is the reduce scatter and there is the all gather. So what happens in reduce scatter, for example? So, so what am I sending to begin with? So my gradients are K size. What am I sending in each cycle? Sorry, Correct, so K divided by N. And how many times am I sending it? Right, so I'm sending that, you know, is it N times or is it slightly less? So it's, uh... so I mean, you're, it's N minus one, exactly. So I need to do that for reduce scatter, right? And so what do I need to do for all gather? I'm sorry? Yeah, exactly. So it's, it's the same thing. So if I, you know, both of them, I'll just put a factor of two. So that's correct. So, so now I finally have, you know, um, a communication cost that doesn't actually scale with the number of GPUs because, you know, N cancels. And is at the top and at the bottom. And so now if I increase the number of GPUs, I'm not increasing my, the communication bandwidth needs. I'm just, you know, scaling my computation. I'm always sending approximately 2K gradients from each uh, GPU to each other GPU. Uh, and so per GPU, maybe in parameter server, you know, each one has to send just K, whereas here I have to send 2K approximately. Um, but, but this is a much more scalable technique basically, and it requires only this ring topology um, to, to work well. So, so this is what most people use actually now. And has anyone heard of Horovod uh, training libraries? So that's how it's implemented there as well. Uh, I believe the first people to work on this were Baidu actually. Um, and then uh, Horovod took their library, which was a fork of TensorFlow and they kind of polished it and made it work with NVIDIA's, um, uh, it's called NCCL, NVIDIA Compute something library. Um, and, um, and yeah, and so many people now use Horovod in industry. I'm, everyone uses Horovod. Horovod is a library written by Uber Labs actually uh, to train large models. Okay, any questions about ring all reduce? So. Yeah, I mean, there are no issues. Usually the gradients are like, you know, the, the K size is like millions or billions in some cases. Um, and, you know, your number of GPUs are usually 
a couple of orders, um, like six orders of magnitude less than that. So it's easy to divide it, you know, a million parameters over eight GPUs or something. It's not a, it's not an issue usually. Okay, and I mean, so far we talked about, um, you know, um, the data parallel training, and we talked about something called synchronous data parallel training. And what that means is that, you know, we are trying to mimic the training on a single node. We're taking all the parameters, we're averaging, averaging them uh, before we run the next forward pass. Um, but there's something called asynchronous SGD as well, or asynchronous training. And what that basically means is that instead of, um, instead of waiting for all of the GPUs to finish what they're doing before computing the average gradients, we will just, as soon as a result comes from GPU zero, we will update the parameters on the server. And then whenever GPU one wants to compute a forward pass or a backward pass, it would just take the latest result or the latest set of parameters from the parameter server and use that. So, so we are not doing averaging of gradients anymore, right? Uh, we're not waiting for all GPUs to finish and doing a synchronous um, weight update. As soon as a piece of my mini batch is finished, I just update the parameters on the server immediately. Um, and the problem with that is obviously, you know, GPU zero may update the parameters on this server here uh, based on its piece of the mini batch, but then GPU one will be using stale uh, parameters. It will be using the parameters from before the update from GPU zero. That's why it's asynchronous. So you have different GPUs operating on a different set of parameters at any given time. They're computing the forward pass with either old or very brand new parameters or something like that. And so that's the problem with asynchronous SGD. Um, that's why it's often less used, although it's much more scalable because you don't need to do that broadcast operation. Um, and typically what you will see is that, you know, it just converges much more slowly um, or you lose some accuracy even in some cases. Um, so, especially as you increase the number of GPUs. So, so yeah, I, I saw that asynchronous is we used way less in industry, but this is actually what Google started with uh, to be able to scale their stuff. They started with asynchronous SGD um, in their data centers. Um, th does that make sense to everyone? Okay. Um, and, you know, so far we talked about data parallelism and model parallelism. Um, there are some uh, ways to combine the two. This is one example. This is an interesting kind of note written by Alex Krzyzewski after joining Google. Uh, he didn't actually stay there for a long time. I think he, uh, he didn't enjoy it very much. But basically, he was also trying to scale his model at Google. And he saw, okay, I will use data parallelism for the convolutions, and I'll use model parallelism for the fully connected layers. Uh, so that's kind of an uh, interesting paper to just go through and see his thought process uh, of how he split the model that way. Uh, but um, the main purpose of this slide is to tell you that people do combine the two in, in many different ways, sometimes by composing them, by having you know, both data and model parallelism on each section of the model, and sometimes by you know, splitting the model in parts and uh, leveraging different parallelism for each part. So. Okay, so we talked about model parallelism, we talked about data parallelism. Uh, now I'll talk very briefly about gradient compression. Um, and so, uh, you know, we, we, what we solved so far with, with, uh, with the string all reduce and data parallelism is the linear scaling of communication costs with the number of GPUs. So that's good. Um, but, you know, can we do better? What is my communication cost now? It scales linearly with K, which is the size of my gradients. Um, so there's a lot of research in the area of just shrinking down those gradients. And it's a lot of the stuff we know from earlier lectures. So some people use quantization on these gradients. So there's this paper called QSGD, which you can go read if you're interested. Uh, but basically, instead of uh, transferring you know, FP32 or 32-bit gradients, we can quantize those gradients to 4-bit or 8-bit. And here's a table from this paper here. So it's showing that, you know, we do get a degradation in terms of accuracy in some cases. 
get an improvement in accuracy in other cases. And people usually just you know, attribute this to, oh, this is a regularization technique, which makes training more robust. Um, and then uh, the speed up um, is usually you know, in the ballpark of 2x. Um, maybe a bit less in some cases, but approximately 2x um, uh, on eight GPUs. So, you know, by reducing that communication cost further, by compressing the gradients that are being transferred between GPUs, you can further get, you know, speed up um, with the number of GPUs that you're scaling. Another method is pruning. So we also know about that from previous lectures uh, for model parameters, but here it's for the gradients being transferred between uh, GPUs. And so, uh, so again, it's all the same techniques. Usually magnitude-based pruning is used here. So you would see the gradients with the smallest magnitude and you would just you know, not transfer them at all and instead transfer zeros. And then you can compress zeros very easily using something called you know, run-length encoding or something um, where you just say, I have five zeros coming up instead of transferring five individual zeros. And so, um, so here there's these plots on you know, MNIST and NMT, which is um, a language task, what's happening? Um, and you see here this yellow line. We are losing um, we are losing a bit of accuracy. Um, so this is the training curve, actually. So throughout training, we are losing accuracy uh, in terms of you know the um, uh, when we're dropping like ninety nine point nine percent of the gradients. But that's a very high pruning rate, right? But when we're dropping just ninety percent, we're matching you know the baseline accuracy basically. And so, um, so what people found is that these gradients are actually quite compressible. Um, and people have been combining both this quantization and the pruning um, to compress uh, this thing that you have to transfer every time you reduce your gradients. OK, and that's kind of quick pointers to just um, what people do in that area. Um, now, um, in the next three minutes, I'll just discuss, you know, uh, an alternative way of doing distributed training, um, and spe specifically model parallelism. Um, and so, uh, you know, we've been talking about GPUs throughout the whole lecture, but you can easily replace, you know, the word GPU with an FPGA. And we, we looked at this architecture way back in the hardware lecture, and it's quite interesting, where they have, you know, uh, these FPGAs connected to the network line before data even goes to the CPU. So usually GPUs are connected somewhere here, right? All GPUs so far are connected somewhere here through the CPU and through a PCIe link. And that's how you connect a TPU or any accelerator. You need the CPU to be the host and the accelerator is connected through PCIe or something. And so data usually has to go through the CPU before it goes to the accelerator and if the accelerator wants to communicate with anything else, sometimes it has to go through the CPU again, unless you have an alternative network like NVLink or something. So the FPGA changes that a bit in Microsoft's data center by adding you know, this FPGA in the network, you know, bump in the wire architecture, right? And so uh, you can kind of think about distributed training now as you know, the piece of my model will come here. It will never go to my CPU, it will just, you know, I compute the forward pass, I compute the backward pass, the gradients, and then I send the gradients straight back out. And so that's what they're doing actually. So they're calling this, you know, this other, you know, accelerator plane connected through this network of routers. And you can implement, you know, a deep neural network on a few of those devices without ever having to go to this, you know, lower plane, which is full of CPUs. So, um, so what does that improve? So if you remember the previous lecture where we talked about you know, the overhead of communicating over PCIe and so on, that overhead is not there anymore because we're intercepting the data before it even kind of makes it to the PCIe links and the CPU, um, CPU land and the operating system there. And what that also gives you is that it gives you very deterministic kind of uh, communication speed um, because um, as I said, you know, you have your OS running on the CPU which can't guarantee a specific latency and depends on how much load is on the CPU and how many threads are running. But with the FPGA, you can actually count the number of cycles it will take to compute the gradients and send the data back out. Um, yeah, and this is what it looks like, you know, to connect different uh, um, FPGAs together. You know, you have usually three levels of networks 
in your uh, or network switches in your data center. And you know, if you want to communicate with a neighboring FPGA, you would just go through this level zero. If you want to connect with a further away one, you would go to level one and so on. And so interestingly, another thing that I saw in that keynote is that NVIDIA is now doing this as well. They also realized that going through the CPU is always going to be a bottleneck for distributed workloads. So even if you're not using NVLink, you'll see that now NVIDIA offers this, you know, instead of this traditional model, like I said, where you have, you know, your network interface card, they call it Connect X7 because that's something they sell, I think. Um, go, data goes from the network through the network interface card to the CPU and then over PCIe to the GPU. So um, they now have a card in which, you know, the GPU sits off of the network interface card. And so I can see it has a lot of, it bears a lot of similarities to the FPGA data center topology at Microsoft. And I can see that how this can be advantageous, especially for distributed workloads where you want to use the data center network itself to scale your, um, to scale your number of devices without having to go through any CPUs and incurring the overhead and the non-deterministic latency associated with, GP with the CPUs. Okay, and that's kind of all I have today. There are a couple of interesting papers that I think you should read. Uh, so please read them, submit your paper summaries, um, and let me know if you have any questions. Um, thanks. <laughs>